Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Today, we have on with us Skip Press. Skip, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks. Glad to be here. Skip, you're a writer. You've been around the Scientology scene a long time. How did you get into Scientology? I had moved to Austin, Texas, and I was determined to be a singer and a songwriter and a writer. Uh, mostly novels. I wasn't thinking about screenplays. And so I was hitchhiking down the road one day, didn't have a car. Guy picked me up in a Volkswagen, had on a suit and tie. I had on a tank top and cut off jean shorts. He said, you want to go to a Scientology lecture? And I said, oh, I've heard of that. And he was shocked. And he said, where'd you hear of it? And I said, oh, I, I read, I've studied a lot about religions and I read a book called The New Religions. And it mentioned that Scientology was the fastest growing religion on the West Coast. And that's about all it said. And he said, well, I'm going to a lecture right now. You want to go? And I saw his suit and tie and I saw what I was wearing. And I said, gee, I don't think I'm really suited for it. You know, I'm just going out to the mall to buy some bed clothes. <laughs> and, and so he, he took me and dropped me off and left. And uh, I was... I was in this little lecture room. Guy came in in a suit, beard, tie, guy named Bill Johannesson, and uh, uh, gave me a Dianetics lecture. So I listened to the Dianetics lecture, and uh, I thought that kind of makes sense. And I told him so. And I said, but I'm not really interested in that. I'm interested in reincarnation. And he said, oh, really? And I said, yeah, do you guys touch that? Oh, yeah, but we call it past lives. So I said, well, whatever. I said, do you think, did you do the Scientology stuff and find out you'd lived before or something? He said, oh, sure. And I said, well, who who, who were you? What did you do? And he said, oh, I was Chateaubriand. No, I never <laughs> heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> Never heard of Chateaubriand. He said, you know, a guy at the French court, it's like a, like the Chateaubriand steak. Yeah. And I said, well, you know, I don't know. All I've ever eaten mostly is a chicken fried steak, which is true. <laughs> I grew up in Texas. Anyway, so I, he taught me in, a, in the communications course. And um, uh, they had pretty girls around uh, the Austin org at the time. And one of them, uh, Paula Hoisington, who I found out was married, uh, she and a, another guy talked me into doing the course, took me to hawk my guitar and my portable typewriter so I'd have $35 to do the course. So I took the course and then I got paid the next week. So I got my stuff out of hawk. Then they wanted me to do the HQS course, Hubbard Qualified Scientologist. So I did that. And uh, there was this auditing that you did with somebody else from a book called Self Analysis. And I did that. And sure enough, on uh, one of the things, I actually bounced into a past life, you know, or thought I did. And I was convinced this was the real deal. And it was uh, had to do with a life that I'd, I'd thought about and been concerned about and didn't know if I was going crazy or not. So anyway, so I was hooked. And then I read a tabloid newspaper from uh, the Celebrity Center called The New Civilization, little thin newspaper thing. And in the back, they had ads. And there was an ad from somebody called Axioms Productions and a phone number. So I called them and I said, hey, you know, I'm here in Austin and I came here to be a singer and a songwriter and a writer. And, you know, I, I've written some things. I, I, I haven't really published anything or been paid to be a writer, but I, I think I could really do a good job. And so she said, we'll hire you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I fell for it because, you know, I was kind of in, in, the, in the mood of different kind of things and adventurous and didn't have any family or anything else to fall back on. And when I started the communications course, I was unsure about it because I was, I was pretty strong in Christian beliefs. And well, well, Skip, uh, I said, Skip, let, let me jump in. How old were you when this was happening? How old were 19? No, I was just, 23. 
23. Okay. So you're, you're a yeah. young person. And, and, and back then there was a lot of new age, spirituality, Eastern stuff going on. Yeah. So, yeah. But, but, but basically Scientology is really good at fast tracking people in who are interested. So, oh man. So what, what happens after you make the phone call? Well, um, I thought about the fact that I, I asked for an omen. I asked God for an omen about whether or not I should do it. And so the night that I started, which was on September 26th, and 26th has always been big in my life, as I got to the org, hitchhiking out there, there was a perfect double rainbow in the sky in the east, and all across the western horizon were flashing lightning and a storm and everything. I thought, wow, okay, I'm supposed to do this. So whenever I, the girl, Sue... Uh, Norton was her name later. I forget what her maiden name was. Uh, whenever she told me, we'll hire you, I thought, well, you know, this is, you know, God is paving the way for me here and I'm supposed to do this. So I, you know, I <laughs> bought a Greyhound bus ticket, had my little suitcase of uh, clothes, my portable guitar, I mean, my portable typewriter and my guitar. And I got on a bus and came to Los Angeles. And the next thing you know, I was uh, at the Celebrity Center on 8th Street near um, MacArthur Park and Alvarado Street. And uh, there I was, man. So then you're at the Celebrity Center. Now, what what did you think of uh, Scientology and the whole thing of celebrity? Did, did, did you think that they had the power to make you into a celebrity, the writer, you wanted to be the singer? I mean, was did they well, pitch it to you that way? No, they didn't. Uh, although one of the things that uh, they would do back in those days, uh, I think uh, Scientology places all over, was they would pitch the celebrities that were involved. Like when I was at the Austin Org, I said, well, so who, who is there anybody I know who might uh, be involved in Scientology, is famous or something? They said, oh, yeah, the Moody Blues. And really? I thought, yeah, and I thought, that doesn't sound right. I said, I don't, I don't, I, they don't strike me as they, they'd be into this. And, and they said, well, we'll call St. Hill in England and we'll prove it to you. So we got on a phone and called St. Hill and got somebody in the public division there and gave, say, are the Moody Blues in the Scientology? No, sorry. No, no Moody Blues. Incredible <laughs> string, incredible string bands in, not, not, not Moody Blues though. So, but you know, it was that, that was not something I cared about. I cared about the principles. I cared about uh, getting ahead. And I figured, well, hey, man, if I'm in Los Angeles and I've got room and board and I'm around uh, some new age thing, uh, you know, enlightenment, I, I hoped. Uh, and, uh, there, and it's called the Celebrity Center. That's, that should be a ticket. Now, just by way of, of uh, some history for New Time Scientology watchers, listeners, uh, the Celebrity Center was begun in 1969 by a Sea Org member named Yvonne Gentsch. Right. And uh, she created it as part of L. Ron Hubbard's older 1955 project, Celebrity. And, and everything in Scientology has a, a stated purpose, what we would call now a mission statement. And uh, L. Ron Hubbard's daughter, Diana Hubbard, wrote the formal definition of Celebrity Center, and it, her father dictated it. But I, I, just so what L. Ron Hubbard's thinking is this, and I'll give it to you, quote, Okay. The exact purpose of Celebrity Center is to help L. Ron Hubbard sell and deliver high standard Dianetics and Scientology services to celebrities and thus convert Earth's top strata of beings into Scientologists. Celebrity is defined in Base Order 7 by L. Ron Hubbard as, quote, any person important in his field or an opinion leader or his entourage, business associates, family or friends with particular attention to the arts, sports, and management and government, unquote. Now that's Flag Order 3484. So unbeknownst to you, there's going on this machine in Scientology to recruit what they call Earth's top strata of beings and, and make them into Scientologists. Yeah. <laughs> and, and at the time, you know, I mean, at the time, Sonny Bono, a 
Sonny and Cher was a Scientologist. The actress Karen Black, Jeffrey Lewis, who is the father of Juliet Lewis, Priscilla Presley, Amanda Ambrose, and John Travolta, who would become a Scientologist in 1975. Now, some background. What I've been able to establish is, of course, Van Morrison did some, some time in Scientology, Edgar Winter, uh, but also uh, Mick Garson of David Bowie's Spiders from Mars was in. So did you get to meet any celebrities right away or were you just, you know, working? Well, I, uh, uh, Axiom Production was all C organization members except for the two guys who ran it, Paul Shapiro and Ken Gerbino. And it had been started by a guy who was a director named Dale Benson who ran up a bunch of debts and wasn't around much. And so I was, uh, you know, supposedly out there to become a writer for them. Well, they had the snack bar concession within a celebrity center. So I ran in the snack bar. So running the snack bar, I met a lot of people. Uh, I met uh, Marion Wagner, who had married Robert Wagner twice. Uh, and her buddy was Flo Allen, who managed Rock Hudson and some other people. And people would come through, like uh, the actress Anne Francis, who was famous for a TV series named Honey West, and she'd also been in uh, uh, a great science fiction movie. Uh, and, uh, you know, a Forbidden Planet. And uh, one day I, I was all by myself, and she pops up. Anne Francis pops up and wants a milkshake. So I made her a milkshake and started talking to her and I was just enamored with her. And then, you know, the next thing I knew, like a week later, she had split and she wouldn't have anything to do with Scientology. And I thought, gee, was it me? But it, it wasn't. <laughs> uh, Diana Hubbard had come and given a talk to a bunch of celebrities and uh, she told them that the purpose of Division Six, the public division, was to capture and control the public. And really, c capture and control? To capture and control the public. <laughs> and, and Anne Francis lit out of there like a dog on fire and, w and wouldn't have anything to do with it. And I'll, you know, a lot of people came around. You know, uh, yeah. uh, Lou, Lou Rawls uh, showed up one time uh, and he'd done a, this was later, I, I actually had two uh, versions of being on staff at Celebrity Center once in 1973 and then went back to Texas and then came back in 1974 and was on staff there. Uh, there was an endless flood of people who would come around investigating it and finding out what it was all about. And on Saturday nights, they would have a thing called Poetry by Candlelight. And people would recite poetry, they'd play music, um, one time I was uh, uh, in a little scene from a play, The Diary of uh, Adam and Eve uh, by uh, Mark Twain had been uh, turned into a stage play by a guy who was kind of a Scientologist, more of a Dianeticist. And so a, a guy named Christopher Keogh got me and uh, Bibby Hansen, who was married to David Campbell, she's Beck's mother, but to do a scene from the play. You know, it's part of Poetry by Candlelight. And, and uh, so it was really a cool place to hang out. Uh, and so you'd get people that would come in and wouldn't do a course or anything. Uh, Roosevelt Greer, uh, you know, famous football player from the LA Rams, yeah. he came in. He came in one time. So there, it was going on all the time around there, you know. And and uh, I probably should tell you some background a lot of people don't know. Sure. Uh, the Yvonne Jinch ran the Advanced Organization Los Angeles, AOLA, before Celebrity Center. And the uh, rock group People with uh, Jeff and Robbie Levin uh, from uh, San Francisco area, who had a number one hit with a thing called I Love You. They'd gotten into Scientology and then blew up the group by firing their, their lead singers because they wouldn't get into Scientology. And then they came down, they were hanging around 
uh, at the AOLA with the Yvonne, and they helped her actually uh, find the building, did a uh, performance with their group to raise money to get into the building on 8th Street, and helped her start it. So it was Yvonne and uh, some assistant she had, whose name I don't remember, didn't meet her, and then the two Levin brothers, and that's how the whole thing got started. Jeff built the stage, and uh, you know, and Jackson Brown would come perform there. Jackson wow. was friends friends with the Levins. Uh, mm. uh, he was friends with uh, Jimmy Spheris, who was you know, famous Scientology musician, and so. It was quite the place to hang out at, and there was nothing that seemed creepy or foreboding or take over the whole world thing. You know, it was like, we're going to clear the planet. And to me, that was just, well, we're just going to spread this this good news and, and how to think more clearly to everybody. So it wasn't anything like you encounter these days. Yeah, it was a, it was more of a, uh, a scene to be in. And uh, what? What what when you did your auditing, were you still doing your course working toward becoming a clear? Yeah, I got into Scientology for three reasons. The idea of clear and not having anything bugging you, recurring thoughts, all that. I like that. Then you were people were promised that they could exteriorize and, and spiritually go out of their body when you hit certain things in Scientology. That was never really delivered, but I'd actually done that before Scientology, just one time. You know, I was out of my body uh, looking down from the ceiling uh, while a Moody Blues song had been playing, a song called Floating. <laughs> and, wow. And I, yeah, and uh, which was about exteriorization. And uh, the other thing was, uh, they had a thing called super literacy at the time where you uh, cleared up any problems with past education and uh, studied the definitions of 10,000 words in the dictionary, literally 10,000 words. So I thought with these three things, man, that really uh, sets me up as a writer. And so that's that's why I got into it. I, I didn't get into it to become superhuman, to become a god. Uh, to lord it over anybody like a lot of people did. You know, it was just to make me more capable, you know. And so, you know, I did those two courses at uh, in Austin, and then I didn't really do anything much at Celebrity Center at first. And then um, I'd done drugs, you know, normal hippie stuff for about a year. And so I got a drug rundown from... I, uh, a student auditor named Rod Davey, and I got a lot of relief from it. You know, I thought, oh, wow, some, it was like having a hangover that you didn't know you had uh, from the drugs and that leaving, you know, and so I felt more clear headed and not inclined to ever do any drugs again. I wasn't anyway, but, you know, so, sure. so it, you know, you know it, it all looked kind of cool to me, you know. And then I got into big trouble trying to, I became the treasury secretary of Axioms and was fending off screaming creditors and, <laughs> you know, who wanted to know when you're going to pay the bills. And there, you know, and Hubbard had ways of, you know, getting around paying bills that he taught. And uh, then the Axioms was in big trouble. So they decided to make me the bad guy. And I got this kind of kangaroo court, this thing called a committee of evidence. And uh, they wanted to declare, the, two of those guys wanted to, to declare that I was a suppressive person. And I was the reason for all, all of Axiom's problems. It was completely insane. And uh, sure. Yvonne, yeah, Yvonne Jensch intervened and said, no, he should go back to the Excalibur ship where you did your basic seaman training. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And, and then uh, she was overridden by somebody who was in charge of ethics for the whole Pacific area. We said, no, he's out of here. So I was, I was uh, on the street, nowhere to go, had 50 bucks and took a bus back to Austin. By the time I got back to Austin, I had five bucks, knew one person in Austin. 
stayed on his couch for a week and then found a room and board place where two girls were moving out. And uh, I, I got that and I had I could eat for two weeks. I got a job and I made it. I survived, you know, and so. Well, wait, Skip, th th let me go back. So Axiom Productions cannot pay its bills. No. <laughs> and you're the f and they blame it on you. They yeah. blame it on you, and you're yeah. declared a suppressive person because they they can't pay their bills. Yeah, well, they, they didn't declare me a suppressive person. They wanted to. And oh, I see. They wanted got, to. Got ameliorated into you know you're just kick the hell out of here, go away. <laughs> so did Scientology order you to out of the celebrity center and to leave? Oh yeah. So, oh, yeah, man. And it's like, you know, street dump. You know, we don't give a shit where you go, you know, what you do, anything about you. Die tomorrow. We don't care. So these days we would use the Internet acronym GTFO. Yeah. Uh, right. Like, <laughs> yeah, get the fuck yeah. out. Yeah. Sorry, pal. You're not cutting <laughs> yeah. it. GTFO. Um, OK, so you're back in Austin. And, you know, you're, you're getting by them. Then what happens next? Uh, so I'm in Austin. I had a freeloader's debt of $1,900, <laughs> $1, $1, uh, which at the time seemed like the world to me. So I don't have a car. I get a job as a milkman delivering milk door to door. Wow. I start make I start making money. And then the door-to-door -door business goes out of business. And so I, I'm driving a milk truck, a big milk truck, delivering to big businesses. I'm having a pretty fun time, you know, uh, and just saying, well, you know, whatever. I'm just going to play, learn, you know, play some music, write some more. And at the time in Austin, it was a great time to be there because uh, they had a place called Armadillo World Headquarters where every great act played and uh, you could get up close to them and everything. And I was enjoying myself. And then, uh, but I that $1,900 paying that off just was like, uh, I don't want to send them any money and stuff. Then one day I get a phone call from Jan Stone, who is the secretary to Yvonne Jinch. And Jan says, you know, what happened to you was really bad. You know, we're really sorry that happened. Yvonne would love. <laughs> <laughs> I can Yvonne see this would, coming. Yeah. Yvonne would love for you to come back. So I'm thinking, gee, well, that was a lot of fun out there, you know. And and I said, well, how about John Murakami, you know, who was the head of my committee of evidence? He's an asshole. And she said, oh, you don't have to worry about him. He and his wife moved, and they're running the Celebrity Center in Las Vegas. <laughs> so, so I said, and I said, well, how about Dale Benson? Oh, no, he's not around anymore. You know, well, I'm not going to work for Axiom, so they're not doing anything anymore. You'll just be working at the Celebrity Center. So I said, yeah. And I said, so I don't have to pay the 1900 bucks? No. Okay. <laughs> so... Yeah. I trotted back out of here, you know, the dummy, you know, but whatever, that's life. Yeah. Okay, now, so you come back to L.A. What, what did uh, Yvonne put you to do? What job well, did she give you? The, I got my first writing job. Uh, really? I, yeah, yeah, I got my first writing job for Celebrity Center. They had a pretty big uh, central files that had been developed, but nobody could get any results writing letters to people, you know? And they had three people working in, and she says, we want you to be the letter registrar. What do I do? Well, you write letters and get people to buy books and come in and take courses and buy, buy auditing. So I said, okay. So I started doing it and people started doing just that. And they were, she was freaked out. You know, and so was everybody else because nobody had ever been able to sell via letters like I had. And once in a while, somebody would buy a book or something. But uh, I just I just got people engaged with those letters, you know. And so I, I ended up uh, becoming the head of uh, what was called the Department of Procurement, which <laughs> so I, was, I was basically a, a pimp for the celebrity center with my letters and stuff, you know, 
and I, I would I would get people engaged and they'd write me back and we'd have a nice repartee and sometimes they'd come in and sometimes they'd buy stuff. Now, Skip, I wanted to jump in here just, just to talk about technology for younger listeners. Um, it, because nowadays everybody, computer is everything, right? But, but, but back then in the 70s, which is what we're talking, it was not unusual to communicate by letters and do correspondence courses. I, I, I remember my, uh, one of my friends in the uh, 70s did a correspondence course with the Rosicrucians. Oh, yeah. And because there's no, you know, long distance phone calls are incredibly expensive back then. You don't do those. So you, you write letters. And my friend was doing this Rosicrucian correspondence course. And he sort of, uh, and people had pen pals where you would write letters to, you know, pen pals and things. So the fact that you're very effective as a writer shows because you're writing letters to people and they're replying to you and they're coming in and doing courses. What, what do you think made your letters stand out? Did you just get, I mean, what made your letters effective versus the letters that didn't work? Well, so, okay, everybody who was in Central Files had a folder, a manila folder, and you would make a carbon copy of every letter you wrote. So I had my little Olivetti portable typewriter that I was using. It was mine. It wasn't owned by the Celebrity Center. And so I'd get a piece of stationery, a piece of paper, carbon between it, and I would type out the letter. And the one thing that Hubbard said to do was, you, you don't know, in, you, they're not, they had this affinity thing. Affinity, reality, and communication made up a triangle. Uh, so the ARC triangle, they called it. Then he says, you don't have any affinity because you're not next to anybody. You're not uh, in proximity with anybody. Uh, you're you're going to communicate with them. But the only thing that you have to go on is uh, any reality that is in the folder. So I would find something they said or something they did, like even just uh, if it was an invoice that they bought a book. And I would go, I would spring off of that reality and get them to communicate with me. And sometimes I'd make kind of little jokey sort of things. So, you know, it was kind of a friendly letter. It was not formal. It was me one-on-one -on -one with them. And I'd get a lot of responses, you know. And then uh, an, a conversation would be engaged that never took place over the phone. Uh, you know, maybe several letters. And I remember one time I got uh, a, a lady to buy uh, her whole academy levels, the basic uh, auditor training, uh, and nobody. And she sent a check through the mail, and it just freaked people out because nothing like that had ever happened, you know. And then then she wanted to meet me uh, when uh, she came in, and I had I had number a number of things like that happened. Uh, there was one. Uh, lady that I was communicating with and she had this she would write me back in this beautiful cursive handwriting just gorgeous and I never saw a picture of, of her didn't know anything about her and so one day Ken Lee who was uh, uh, one of the guys in division six he comes and gets me says hey uh, somebody's here wants to meet you and I said who's that and he, and he said uh, Catherine Bach Say Catherine Bach. Oh, she's she's on a TV show or something, right? He says, Yeah, yeah, she's she's just dying to meet you. So I go out there with Ken, and uh, Ken and I. She, she was in the Robert Lyons acting class. I don't know if she was on Dukes of Hazard yet, but she was gorgeous. And so Catherine loops her arm inside mine, and she's leaning her head on my shoulder. And Ken Lee and I are showing her all around the Celebrity Center and where everything takes place, you know. And she was she was just kind of, you know, <laughs> coming at me. And Ken is just his eyes are bugging out, and uh, and and she's just saying, "I love your letters. You write such nice things to me, and I'm I'm glad you like my handwriting and all that sort of stuff." And so I'm like, hey, great, you know, but it was it was supposed to be hands off between staff and uh, public people. So that's as far as it went with me. Right. But then I didn't hear from her. <laughs> I, I didn't hear from her for a while. And so I went off a reality 
And I said, you know, I'm really worried because I haven't heard from you in two or three letters that I've written you. I'm afraid you might end up like Marilyn Monroe or something. <laughs> <laughs> and that got her attention, boy. She was bitching to Bobby Lyons about it, and she, she called Yvonne, and I was, like, called on the carpet for being a jerk. You know, how dare you say something like that? I said, well, hey, man, you know, I was just going on whatever reality I could figure out. <laughs> and she never came back. <laughs> yeah, I could see why. Um, you know, now let's talk for a minute. Skip, changing, changing gears here. Okay. I'm frequently asked by journalists and other people, uh, what is the attraction of Scientology to celebrities? And I qualify that by saying not all celebrities. But in general, what's your opinion? Why? What does the Church of Scientology Celebrity Center offer to a celebrity? Why do they go there? What are they looking for? What do they want? Well, he uh, Hubbard actually was accurate with this. He said the time to get them into Scientology is when they're on their way up or on their way down. And that happened. That, uh, that happened uh, over and over and over. Um, because, you know, if somebody's doing real well and they're a celebrity and everything, they're like, I don't need this, you know. But we'd have, we would have people come in like Larry Parks. And most people have no idea who Larry Parks was. But he was, a, he was a very successful actor. At one time, he played Al Jolson in the Al Jolson story. And uh, he, he showed up one day and was, was knocking around there. So this is a guy who, in the Jolson story was like early 50s or something. So Larry sure. Parks, he was way down on, on his success as, a, as an actor. Um, and then on, on the flip side, uh, John Travolta. Uh, came in, and uh, John was very unhappy with his life, and uh, Joan Prather uh, got him in, and she had done this horrible movie with him in Mexico called The Devil's Reign, and John was real unhappy with his life. He, he only had a sixth grade education, you know. He wasn't the big giant superstar, nothing even close. And I didn't know so that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, he he uh, came in. He did a communication course. He liked that. And he did the HQS course, and he th was thrilled with that. And uh, they would have a, a graduation ceremony every week in a sort of a semi-parking lot in front of the Celebrity Center on 8th Street. And uh, John got Welcome Back Connor, I think, while he was doing the HQS course. And he bought his little baby blue Thunderbird convertible that he'd always wanted. And so he and uh, Gilda Midoff, uh, who was married to Ray Midoff, she was the HQS supervisor at the time. And so we had this big uh, gala kind of uh, a graduation ceremony and John and Gilda come driving up into the parking lot in that blue, that baby blue Thunderbird. And, uh, you know, it was quite a spectacle. So, so there was John on the way up, Larry Parks on the way down. Larry, Larry didn't end up doing anything, but that's that's a, that's who you would get in. You get people in who were ha having some downturn in their career, you know, a little bit. Even uh, Flo Allen even got Rock Hudson to come in and get an auditing session. So everybody thought we were going to turn Rock Hudson into a celebrity uh, for you know Scientology. And then the the auditor, a guy named uh, Carmine Terra, who was a bit of a celebrity himself. He'd, he'd been in West Side Story, uh, one of the principals in West Side Story in the Europe uh, version. And uh, so Carmine was auditing him, and he, he hit uh, on some little thing that probably had to do with Rock's homosexuality. And Rock shut up and got up and walked out of the room and, and would never talk about it again. <laughs> yeah, you know, Skip, this is this is so interesting because uh, the policy of getting people on uh, on the way up. This explains why Scientology goes to all sorts of uh, casting calls here in Hollywood, where the people who want to make it into the business, you know, are, are standing in line. And uh, absolutely, yeah. And, yeah. and Stephen Mango talks about this. Uh, 
you know, he was an aspiring actor who came to Hollywood and, uh, you know, they, 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 they focus in on your desire and, and, uh, Stephen Mango told me, of course, that, you know, we have all the connections to all the casting directors in Hollywood. We have Tom Cruise and Travolta, and we have a well-oiled machine that can help make you more successful than you are. Well, with Stephen Mango, $50,000 later, he's broke. He spent all the money he's had. He's in debt. And then they say, um, you know, you really belong in the Sea Org. It's like a bait and switch. That's, that's what it turned into. And uh, but it's an interesting observation that that actors on the way down who've had uh, career reversals, they target them. And uh, we were talking about a celebrity, uh, you know, getting ready for the show. And you made a very trenchant observation, Skip, that there's been several celebrities who've gone into Scientology. And when they make it, they say, I don't need Scientology anymore. Hasta la vista. They oh, just yeah. don't need it anymore. Yeah. And uh, and what does Scientology do when someone blows them off? Like, I don't need you anymore. There's really not a lot the church can do, can it? No. And uh, and they would always make, a, I mean, it was different rules for celebrities. You know, like, so um, by 1978, I was uh, out of uh, not working for a celebrity center anymore. I was a public person. I went on a TV game show. I won $14,000 in cash and prizes in a new car. And, uh, and <laughs> what, what was the game show? Just, just curious. It was, it was a show on uh, NBC called Knockout. It was hosted by Artie Johnson, who'd been on Laugh-In. It's on, I've got the clip of me winning the car and uh, it's on my I'll YouTube. send it over. We'll, we'll put it in the show notes. Yeah. And uh, so I had a little bit of money, and by that time, uh, Yvonne Jench was out at Celebrity Center and and uh, had been busted by Hubbard. It's one of the nastiest things that ever happened. And then she was doing a thing called the Public Relations Organization, and Spanky Taylor was helping her. And so Spanky calls me one day, and uh, uh, John Travolta <clears throat> wants help with uh, the new... Uh, first female sweat hog on Welcome Back, Cotter. It's a girl named Melanie Haller, and she's blonde, absolutely beautiful, and she needs help buying a car. And so uh, I helped Melanie. I was enamored with her, went out a few times, helped her buy a car, loaned her $1,000, I think, for a used car, never paid me back, you know. And, I, and so I wanted to get some way to you know, get her to pay me. I think she did the communications course or something. And I was told flat out, you can't do anything. You can't take her to a small claims court, nothing, because she's a celebrity. And I thought, I said, well, hell, I'm a celebrity, you know, by definition, by now. And, you know, I was I, I was in the parking lot of a grocery store in Beverly Hills and one of the guys from the Mission Impossible TV series drives up in his Rolls Royce and waves at me and goes, hey, I saw you on TV. So I said, oh, am I not a celebrity? Why can't I answer? Her? But no, no, no. So they would they would make they would make uh, all kinds of excuses for any bad thing that a celebrity who was on TV or in the movies would do uh, so they, they could keep them in, keep them involved. Sure. <clears throat> now, you had you had a. a, a some experience with Amanda Ambrose. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. What, what, what was your, what, what did you do with Amanda? What was your relationship with her? We were just friends. I first met Amanda when she was uh, in Hollywood, playing at a theater in Hollywood. She was headlining a show and I forget the name of it. It, she, it had been on Broadway. Uh, Amanda, had been Amanda was big before she got into Scientology. Amanda played Carnegie Hall by yeah. herself. You know, she was the main attraction and stuff. So, uh, you know, I kind of knew Amanda. Kind of hung out with her a little bit. I'd help her with stuff uh, if if necessary. She was uh, she was doing some kind of Head Start kind of thing for uh, trying to you know get into the black community and. Uh, she got some of her friends in, like an actress singer named Paula Kelly, who was a dancer. Uh, you know, and there there weren't so there weren't very many black people uh, 
involved in Scientology. And uh, so Amanda kind of stuck, uh, stuck out, you know. And so, <clears throat> you know, I, didn't, I wasn't really close friends with her, but I knew her pretty well. One time I asked her, hey, you know, there's a lot of really talented people around Celebrity Center and uh, in Scientology and in the arts. And I just wonder why they're not bigger in their careers. And Amanda goes, well, it's because it's not safe. And I said, what do, you, what do you mean? She said, well, if they went out there and did everything they could with their OT powers, they'd get attacked. It's just not safe. Ah. So, you know, yeah. That kind, oh, of, that, that kind of loony think would pop up often. Oh, yeah, you have to. Uh, L. Ron Hubbard said you, you can't go showing off your OT powers or, you know, because it is dangerous. And that <laughs> anyway, that aside, what about Karen Black? Yeah, Karen, you know, I, I knew Karen a little bit. Um, you know, I was at a, you know, a New Year's Eve uh, Christmas party, uh, you know, Karen put on. Uh, she read, you know, some of my scripts, tried to get it, uh, a director of hers to make a movie of mine. Uh, she spoke at uh, a writer's club thing that uh, I... Uh, uh, Put together with Paul Haggis, and uh, we'd have speakers come in and talk, you know. And would and by that, and by the time we did that, the Celebrity Center had moved to where it is now, uh, on uh, uh, Bronson and Franklin in uh, Hollywood. And uh, you know, and, and uh, Karen and I, you know, we hit it off pretty well. We were just friends, not not great friends, but you know, I could call her up. Um, now, she was married to Martin Martin Landau at the time. Uh, you you write in the Martin Report. No, she was married to uh, Kit Carson. Oh, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. She married yeah, yeah, Kit, yeah, yeah, Kit, Kit Carson. Kit Carson, who's the father of Hunter Carson, who her son, their son, who was in uh, Paris, Texas, the movie Paris, Texas, and Mart and I was at a, a party at her house. She lived over in Hancock Park, this gated community, and uh, Martin Landau was at the party. And, you know, I met Martin there and, and stuff. And Karen was an interesting Scientologist because Karen was actually very intelligent. Uh, not that Scientologists aren't intelligent, but she was, you know, she played a lot of dumb girl kind of parts, but she was really very intelligent. And uh, uh, I, we kind of hit it off like that. And I, I was taking her home one time after she spoke at, at my writer's thing. And she looks over at me and she says... Uh, you know, she says, you just kind of don't give a damn about much, do you? Meaning to say that I was pretty flippant about stuff and didn't let stuff get to me, you know. And I said, not really. <laughs> <laughs> and she she laughed and laughed about that, you know. So, she, you know, Karen was, Karen managed to keep her acting life and her Scientology life a bit separate. But when she got into Scientology, when Celebrity Center was still over on 8th Street, Karen was friends with a lot of people who, um, through her, I think, had entree to Scientology. She was friends, and so was Yvonne Jinch, with a woman named Helena Kalianotis who had a club called Helena's that was over in the, uh, I guess you'd say the Alvarado Park area, Ramparts even, you know, that was the thing for several years. You know, Jack uh, Nicholson and, and all kinds of actors uh, who later became very big would be there. And then actors that were uh, famous and famous musicians and stuff. And, uh, and, you know, Kelly Notis was, was one of those celebrities who had been in Scientology, but didn't come around the Celebrity Center much. So <clears throat> there was kind of a, a crowd of people who were all familiar with Scientology, who were celebrities of some sort, uh, and, and um, just didn't hang around the place, if you know right. what I mean. Sure, and and this is interesting because uh, 
uh, the Hollywood Reporter uh, did a piece on H Helena Caliontes. Uh, and in 2018, she sort of did a tell-all. Yeah. And and did, did the article mentions Jack Nicholson, and Angelica Houston, Prince, Madonna. A lot of people went to that club. Right. So th there, there's sort of a, a network. And I, I'm going to run some names by you real fast. Okay, so okay. we have now Helena... Uh, herself was not a Scientologist. She just had a members-only club. Well, no, she did some. She did some auditing. At least Yvonne oh, she, said she did. Yeah, Yvonne James told me she did. So I don't know. Well, that's interesting to know. I I, I didn't know that because she was a uh, she was very much like a um, a celebrity in her own right as a hostess. Yeah, of her, she was. Of her she's club. kind of a. a Doyen, I guess you'd call her. You know, she she was in. Uh, she had a little small part in Five Easy Pieces with Karen and Jack. Yeah. So, so this was going on now. At the same time, uh, Milton Kitsalis, he was a famous acting coach, best friend of Heber Jansh. In fact, he was the best man at, at Karen and Heber's wedding. Oh, I didn't know that. Well, wow. yeah, it was well, yeah. He he and Heber were very close. Was Milton Kitsalis active at the time? Yeah, you know Milton. See, that's the kind of people I'm talking about again a little bit. Milton, uh, Floyd Mutrix, writer, director, you know, they all they kind of just did their own thing. You know, uh, Milton at one point found out where the ship Apollo was in uh, Hubbard and he knew Hubbard. He'd met Hubbard. And so Milton, Milton decides to just go over there and show up <laughs> and and they docked in the port, and there's Milton. I don't know where he got that info from, but he was waiting for him, you know. And 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 Hubbard got treated him nice, gave him tour of the boat and all that stuff. But he was pissed off, from what I heard, that Milton had tracked him down and broken through all the subterfuge and clandestine activities, and uh, and showed up to say hi, you know. Yeah, that would so, be out, out security. Oh, oh totally. Yeah, so, so you know, Milton kind of did his own thing, you know, and uh, and then he he started his uh, his theater in Beverly Hills, Beverly Hills Playhouse, which was unbelievably instrumental in getting celebrities into Scientology. I think that's how uh, Priscilla Presley came through there, or uh, and but she she asked John Travolta about it, and John got her in, but I but she was doing classes over there. Well, b before we go to Priscilla Presley, and I do want to talk about Priscilla, uh, the widow of Elvis Presley. You know, I asked Alan Barton about Celebrity Center and Milton Katsalas. And basically, because Scientology is built on a commission system, that is, if I'm a Scientologist and I recruit people into Scientology, I get 10% cut as an FSM, a field staff member. Right. And so Milton... Milton's Beverly Hills Playhouse, Milton allowed the Scientologists there to recruit people. And so it did become a pipeline into Celebrity Center, but a lot of people in order to pay for their acting lessons, in order to pay for their Scientology courses, it's sort of like a multi-level marketing scheme. And so Milton Katsalas's place became a pipeline. And yes. So, so now you're saying that Priscilla Presley was studying acting with Milton Gonzalez, who's a legendary acting teacher, uh, and that's how she got in. With how did Travolta get her in through to the Beverly Hills Playhouse? Do you know I the story? I, I don't. I don't know that story at all. I just know that Travolta called Spanky Taylor one day and said, "Hey, you know, I I need your help. Uh, Priscilla Presley's interested in Scientology." You know, and, uh, and Spanky later got me a job answering Elvis mail for Priscilla, really? and which I did. Yeah, which which I did for quite a while. And when Priscilla and I first met, we were uh, over in a place called Crossroads of the World and we were sitting alone in this little office and we talked for an hour and a half. And Spanky is uh, freaked out. After Priscilla leaves, she's like, I can't believe that she just talked to you for so long. I've never seen her so natural with uh, someone like that. And I said, well, I don't know. I, I like her gut. She's really good looking. You know, and yeah. Elvis was Elvis was my hero. And so I answered I answered uh, the Elvis mail for, for a while. And then <clears throat> one day, 
Spanky says, oh, Priscilla's having trouble. I said, what's going on? She said her boyfriend hit her. And I went, what? And I don't know if this was Mike Stone, the karate guy, or if it's somebody else. And then Spanky says, you know, Priscilla needs a good Scientology boyfriend like you, Skip. And I, I, <laughs> I freaked out because I could just see newspaper headlines, press, not quite Presley, or something like that, you know? So well, I, I, was, yeah. <laughs> I was a young dummy. And so I, I just wrote her a letter and said, I must quit working for you because I'm afraid if I continue that I'll fall in love with you or you'll fall in love with me. And I don't think it would be right for either of us. And, and she got totally ticked off because nobody had ever quit working for a Presley, you know, after they started. And, you know, and I was an aspiring screenwriter, an aspiring musician, and I just didn't, you know, I just didn't, I, you know, I was just freaked out by the whole idea. And then, you know, what did she do? She ends up with Marco Garibaldi, who was an aspiring screenwriter and an aspiring musician and has a child with him, you know? Oh, Skip, what could have been? Now, yeah, well, when, right. when, when Priscilla Presley gets into Scientology Celebrity Center, that had to be a big deal. I mean, that had to be reported right to L. Ron Hubbard, one would imagine. Oh, you, big. But uh, there's another story about this with Elvis. There was, yeah. a, there was a Scientology mission on Sunset Boulevard. And Elvis was married to Priscilla, but he was dating Peggy Lipton, who whose brother, Kenny Lipton, was a, a Celebrity Center staff member. And Peggy was OT3. And so she... Uh, she was... She this was Peggy Lipton who starred on the Mod Squad. That Peggy Lipton, yeah. Wow. And and so she she takes uh, Elvis to the Sunset Mission, and Elvis goes in, and it was a small little place, and has the entire Scientology organization chart explained to him, and and then the story was that he comes out of there, and Red West was with him, and and. Elvis says, "Those all those some bitches want is my money. Let's get out of here, right?" Yeah. Okay, but Priscilla said that Elvis paid for the entire Scientology bridge that day, and was going to do it. And then the Memphis Mafia, all his pals, talked him out of it. So you know that's what Priscilla said. So Elvis that- Presley could have gotten into Scientology, but he didn't. Uh, his Memphis mob had a lot of influence on him. Oh, and, yeah, uh, and we also don't know if he uh, paid for his entire bridge just to get the hell out of there so they would leave him alone. Yeah, <laughs> true enough. <laughs> Could be. You know, well, <laughs> Priscilla, Priscilla said he paid for it. So, you know. Well, I don't doubt that he paid for it, but he, he, he did make a remark that all those son of a bitches won is your money. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, yeah. And then Priscilla, uh, uh, of course, Lisa, Lisa Marie, uh, her, their daughter followed mom into Scientology. Yeah, well, uh, Lisa Marie, Priscilla was having big trouble with Lisa Marie. Lisa Marie was in a French academy type place on the west side, and she was into drugs, and she was just not a happy kid. You know, I mean, I think losing her dad was a great tragedy of her life. And, Absolutely. Uh, you know, and so Priscilla got uh, Lisa Marie in and, you know, got her off drugs with Scientology. And so, you know, um, I used to, uh, by 19, I don't know, 80 or something, 81 maybe, uh, I was, uh, no, more like 82, I was renting a house uh, a block north of the Celebrity Center on Franklin Avenue. And I was with uh, Richard Acunto, who later started the Survival Insurance Company, and Nicky Hopkins, a famous uh, rock musician. And uh, there was a little guest house behind it, and there was a garage. And uh, Lisa Marie used to uh, show up there because she was dating Danny Keogh, who had a band with uh, Chad uh, Correa, uh, Chick Corea's son. Is it Chad? I don't know, something like that. Uh, and they would they would rehearse in the garage. So I'd see Lisa all the time, you know, and, and 
you know, then later I got to be friends with Priscilla's uh, uh, boyfriend, Michael Edwards, who moved in with her and uh, was over uh, over at their house. And uh, Priscilla and Michael were trying to uh, do a housing development on an island where he used to go to camp as a kid in West Virginia. So, you know, the, the Presleys were in and around uh, the place all the time, you know. Sure. Skip, what what uh, what what events uh, led you to leave the Church of Scientology? What happened? What's the story? It's pretty simple. Um, I was a pretty high producing executive person, director of procurement, you know, and uh, I have pretty much a photographic memory, and so I would remember people's names, what they bought and where they lived and stuff like that. So I was, I was, I thought I was fairly irreplaceable. You know, I got uh, the central files, uh, completely up to date, uh, with the help of some other staff members. Nobody had ever done that apparently in any Scientology organization, I was told. So I thought I was doing pretty good, but Hubbard buys the old Cedars of Lebanon Hospital in, I think, 1977 and paid $13 million cash for it, but it needed a lot of renovation. So suddenly, all of these executives like myself who were high producers were being told that they were list one RSers. So that meant they had a rock slam needle manifestation on the e-meter and that came about if you had evil intentions toward Hubbard or some of his family or something like that except I found out later that what was really going on was uh, the lady who was in charge of qualifications worldwide work with Hubbard lived on the ship uh, Paulette Osley did not know the difference between a rock slam and a dirty needle, which is just a little jiggle of the needle, you know? And so Hubbard knew that she didn't know. And so they used that to say, all these people have uh, rock slams. They have evil intentions. And so me and all kinds of other people were told, you have to go to the rehabilitation project force to be rehabilitated and get yourself fixed up or we will declare you a suppressive person and throw you out of Scientology. So, and, the, and I verified that Paulette was screwed up on that with Nikki Merwin, who I later dated, who was Mary Sue Hubbard's uh, uh, secretary, communicator, and then John Osley, who was married to Paulette at the time. So I got it from two different sources. And uh, so anyway, so I go to the Rehabilitation Project Force, and I go, oh, this is fucked up. <laughs> you know, this is all messed yeah. up. There, there were people, you know, that I had respect for who were standing up going, oh, my God, you know, I just realized what a horrible person. And this one guy, Mike, Mike Matias, I think his name was, he was from Advanced Organization. He's a heavy set guy. And he stood up and he goes, I realized in session that I was a Nazi tank commander in my last life. And we were running over people and laughing. And that's why I am where I am today. And there was stuff oh, like geez. that that was going on. And I went, this is bullshit. And so this lady says, come with me. And she takes me down to the uh, RPF's RPF, which is the lower than low. And we were working right. in these dirty conditions, cleaning up all this crap and, and stuff. And then finally I said, this is ridiculous. I'm not doing this. And, they, and she says, come with me. And so they had a room down in the bowels of uh, the big, what's now the big blue building. And in that room were a few people who were just uh, non rehabilitatable and they were called the turkeys. And so what, what they would do with the turkeys is they would, uh, somebody would come in and browbeat them and yell at them and tell them they were shit and all this sort of stuff till finally somebody would go, I'm going to get out of here and I'm going to call a lawyer. And so as soon as that happened, then you were a, a potential trouble source type C. 
and could not be real rehabilitated and you were thrown out of Scientology. So that was their way of really sticking it to you. So I, I went, well, I'm not, I'm not going to let them pull that on me. So I worked my way back up to the RPF. And then uh, one uh, night when we had our one day of the uh, week when we could wash our clothes in the shower, uh, I uh, put all my stuff in a pillowcase. And uh, while I was waiting for my twin, who was supposed to be watching me, um, while he was washing his clothes in the shower, I ran up on a, to a second, up some stairs to a second story balcony, jumped off with my stuff and ran out to Sunset Boulevard and, uh, <laughs> and, and walked, walked five miles, walked five miles to uh, the one person I knew in his apartment, he and his wife uh, took me in and let me sleep in their closet. And so then they, you know, I, the Celebrity Center had my guitar and my typewriter, and I had an expensive Martin guitar by that time. And so I went and said, I want it back. And they said, no, you got to go back and do the RPF. And I said, it's my property. You can't keep my property from me. Well, we will. And I said, I'll, you know, what if I call the police? Well, then you'll be out of Scientology forever. And so anyway, so I went back and then I did what was called the routing out thing where they do security checks on you with a meter and everything. And it was always, well, there was really nothing wrong. Oh, you're not really an R RSer. And so, but I had a choice to just leave. And so I left and uh, me and a bunch of other people had to sign this thing saying if we ever said anything about what went on there, we'd had to pay the, the Scientology, Church of Scientology, $50,000. And I looked at the, the woman and I and I laughed. I said, this is not enforceable. You can't. And she said, oh, yes, it is. And I said, no, it'll never stand up in court of law because there's mistreatment going on over here. So, you know, I was out four months, I guess, maybe. Uh, went on a game show, won all the money and then set and, and had money to pay my debt, you know. <laughs> and there, everybody was freaked out because Hubbard would tell people if they ever left the sea organization, they'd basically turn into bums on the street but, but you yeah. wind up with your your martin guitar back your your portable typewriter and yeah. you you want a lot of money hey, skip i'd like to to continue in another interview because there's so many rich details here but i do want to add this uh, at the beginning of the interview you said you met a fellow who who told you he was chateaubriand in his last life right and so so this piqued my curiosity i'm up on google the fellow's name is Francois René de Chateaubriand, 1768-1848. And it says, uh, historian Peter Gay says that Chateaubriand saw himself as the greatest lover, the greatest writer, and the greatest philosopher of his age. And yeah. he, was, he was the French ambassador to the Papal States. And this is kind of a funny thing when people talk about who they were in their past life. It's never like, hey, I was some schlub horse thief who got hanged. You know, I was a nobody. It's right. always got to be, you know, uh, the Egyptian princess, Chateaubriand, uh, you know, someone great. H Hubbard himself thought he was Cecil Rhodes. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Cecil, of course, was a gay man. And uh, that Hubbard didn't, uh, that didn't occur to him at the time or he didn't know. But uh, well, I can I can tell you a quick story about that real quick. Please. So, uh, uh, Bill, Bill Howie was uh, uh he was married to irene howie who later became irene derman and uh irene and uh, joyce uh de wolf uh both who had been uh, top assistants for yvonne uh, at celebrity center ended up going over and working uh, for milton casales and building up his whole thing at the beverly hills playhouse well, anyway so bill was on a ship when he was married to irene and uh, Hubbard uh, would stay up late, and he had a thing called the quartermaster uh, that would, uh, you know, watch the ship, stay stay awake all night and stuff. But then people would hang around, and Bill did a perfect imitation of Hubbard, and so he was <laughs> he was he was the quartermaster one night. And he's talking to a couple of buddies. He's going, well, you know, in the Galactic Confederacy of 75 trillion years ago, or something <laughs> like that. And they're laughing, ha, ha, ha. And they look over in a, a doorway, and there's Hubbard just staring at <laughs> oh, 
God. I didn't say a word, walked <laughs> away. The next day, a policy came out called Joker and Degrader, and talking about people that joke about <laughs> Uh, lots, of, <laughs> lots of people and stuff, and and that it's an evil thing to do, and that if you you were uh, lacking a valence, meaning a personality, uh, get your own or something like that, right? Well, so Bill Howie also, I believe, was, when Hubbard used to go around bragging on the ship that he was Cecil Rhodes and all that sort of stuff. I think it was Bill Howie who came up one time and said, you know, Ron, uh, or Commodore, whatever he called him, he said, "You know, uh, uh, Cecil Rhodes was gay." You know, and yeah, <laughs> and Hubbard <laughs> stopped talking about that after that. You didn't hear any more about Cecil Rhodes. You know, you know. <laughs> that but is so when funny. I, when I first got to the Celebrity Center, everybody was it had been everybody. I mean, that it was people were just obsessed with it, totally obsessed with it. There was a a girl, a staff member. Uh, named Audrey Fisher, who published, uh, we had a regular mimeograph thing called Orders of the Day that would come out every day. And uh, Audrey Fisher published in the Orders of the Day one time that she had a fantastic session and realized she'd been Harry Houdini in a past life. And, wow. And, and, uh, and uh, Yvonne put her in a, a condition uh, because she was talking about her case, you know, her her uh, psychological troubles out of out of session, which, which you weren't supposed to do, you know. So that, that that kind of stuff went on all the time. It was like a contest on who who could out famous person somebody. <laughs> that is so funny, especially your your uh, story about Hubbard uh, writing the Joker's and Degrader's policy. I'll put that in the show notes as well. You know, it's funny. I tell people the first thing that happens when you go into Scientology is you get a humorectomy. They rip that sense of humor out of you because, L. Ron Hubbard said, Scientology is a deadly, serious activity. What we do here in Scientology will affect the entire agonized fate of every man, woman, and child on this planet. My God, if I had to live with that kind of seriousness, no thanks. But well, th that uh, is let me let me tell you one more quick story about that. So sure. there was a there was a, a a couple of musicians, Pat Robinson and Pat Marischak, uh, both played guitar, sang, uh, had a really cool group called uh, Back Pocket. And so they went to perform on the flagship Apollo one time. They were around Celebrity Center on 8th Street. And they came back and I was like, hey, what was it like? What did I... And he said, well, we couldn't believe it. Everybody there drank like a fish. And I said, you mean Ron too? I said, oh, yeah, we had a big party and everybody was just drunk off their butts. You know, so so much for the seriousness. You know what I mean? I mean, it, it was it was no, never what it was purported to be. Well, no. And I know that sometimes uh, uh, they would drink and they'd have to just go on a bend or like, you know, like forget about the rules and drink on the ship and at other places like in the. Um, oh, that place up after the. Uh, memorial at the Palladium for uh, L. Ron Hubbard's death. We right. had a party up at that house. Uh, it was Charlie Chaplin's old house or some, uh, some celebrities, you know, house. Yeah, and that's the, when, it, when it was on 8th Street, uh, Yvonne and some of the staff lived in Charlie Chaplin's old house, which was uh, not far off 8th Street on another street. Well, apparently after the uh, very serious memorial service well, where it was announced that L. Ron Hubbard had causatively dropped his body, they went up to that house and really the booze poured freely that night. Of course, even the uh, Francois de, René de Chateaubriand was there in his new body. But yeah. nevertheless, it's been, <laughs> it's been, it's been, it's been a, a great podcast. Love talking to you. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. There's so much more that I didn't tell you about. You know, Jerry oh. Seinfeld and uh, oh, you know we all these other. So talk about Jerry Seinfeld. Well, we're going to yeah. leave. We're going to leave our audience. Uh, Chris, Mr. Chris Superman. You know. Oh, Chris. Uh, is, well, yeah. How, how Superman flew away from Scientology. That's a pretty good story. The Celebrity Center, New York. All kinds of stuff. Well, let's then let's leave our audience with a cliffhanger. Next podcast, we will talk about Scientology and Jerry Seinfeld. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to leave you a teaser. It's more than you think. Jerry Seinfeld was in 
much deeper than he lets on. So with that, thank you for being on our show, Skip Press. Glad to do it. A lot of fun. Yeah, it, likewise, it was uh, it was a blast. And we'll be back on for Surviving Scientology Radio. This is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Thank you so much for listening. And as always, we'll be in very good touch. <laughs>